I was explaining to Mr. Brain, however, that um, my uncle, who was part of my very religious family on my mother's side, um, we, we mix it up a bit. And every chance I've gotten to send my younger relatives to why won't God heal amputees.com, <laughs> Uncle Travis hasn't really been able to come back with anything. If your God is so mighty, Uncle Travis, I'm sorry, Bishop Uncle Travis, if your God can do anything, Bishop Uncle Travis, why won't he regrow human limbs? Are we not as, are we not as pleasing to his sight as the lowly salamander? My uncle, Bishop Travis Jones, has not had a response just yet, but uh, the gentleman who is very good at taking trolling to the next level, to the point where it actually makes the case so compellingly that even my uncle has to concede that he's lost. Um, Marshall Brain, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It is so good to be here. Oh my gosh, to be uh, enwrapped in folks who understand and get it. I just, I thank you for how welcome you've made me feel here. And before I get started, I wanted to just say one thing on behalf of the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. So this, you might have seen, a, was in CNN last weekend, I believe. This is Harry Shaughnessy and his wife Charlotte and the family. They had a huge expose done on them that explained atheism and how atheism works in the real world. Now, Harry lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, and he is the founder of Secular Together. So in Raleigh, there is a strong effort to create an atheist community that meets on Sundays and does many of the things that folks who are ex-Christians are used to doing but without any of the religion involved in it. And if you would like to learn more, you can go to seculartogether.org. Also from Raleigh, I believe our next speaker, Todd, there's, there's Harry, who is a powerhouse, Todd, who is a powerhouse, and then, by coincidence, I happen to live in Raleigh as well. So you probably, or you might have heard of the question, why won't God heal amputees? So I created that website. And prior to creating that website, that question did not exist in the public vernacular. And if you look on Google now, there's 366,000 pages that deal with that. And the best part is all the memes. The memes are utterly fantastic. So then I followed that with the website uh, godisimaginary.com. And the cool thing about God is imaginary is if you go to Google and you type in the word God, there are 1.6 billion pages that talk about God, and God is imaginary is number six. So that is amazing, a true blessing. My latest effort is this book, How God Works, which is trying in a very soft and, and rational way to help folks who are Christians or Muslims to understand that God is imaginary through critical thinking and reason. So my message to you between Harry and Todd and I, if you're an atheist, consider Raleigh, North Carolina as a place to come visit or to come live. And this message brought to you by the Raleigh Tourism Board. So, so let's get started. I want to start with the most interesting fact I know. And we all know it, but it bears repeating, and it is this. Hydrogen, given sufficient time, turns into people. Now that is the scientific explanation for where we came from. And it's like, holy shit, when you think about that, but it's like... Unbelievable how amazing that is, that you put enough hydrogen and give it enough time and between stellar fusion and evolution and abiogenesis and all that, poof, you get people eventually. It's just amazing. So this is what I want you to consider. Imagine that it has turned into other species as well on other planets. And if you're familiar with the Drake equation, 
you know that that is a pretty high probability event. There could be a billion other extraterrestrial species. So furthermore, imagine that they come to visit. So they arrive in their gigantic spaceship. They are ready to come interview the human species. They interview every single one of us by sending millions of envoys down to planet Earth. We each have a personal interview with this extraterrestrial species. And, you know, they would notice our technology, but our technology would be so pathetic compared to theirs. After all, they did come in this giant spaceship and stuff, that the technology and the things we've done would seem pretty minor to them. What they would definitely notice is the weirdness of humanity. So if you think, what might they notice? They might notice that we have 5,000 nuclear missiles able to destroy whole cities. And if we were to launch 10 of them at once, we would probably destroy our whole existence because of nuclear winter and all of that. If we launched hundreds of them, it would be game over. We have this massive economic inequality. We have massive poverty, environmental destruction. We're pumping 32 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. We have prisons. We have a mass extinction event on the way. We have racism, sexism, homophobia running rampant. We talk about it openly like, I'm a racist, and we are happy. Like, we, we let people do that. There's wars, there's disease, there's 10 million children dying every year. It's like, it's crazy. And so they might start to suspect that human beings are insane because we have a lot of those kind of markers we're giving off that they notice in our interviews. But then they're going to notice religion. And this could be their, their firm marker that is, there is some insanity going on. And they aren't going to just notice religion because of this graph. This is how pervasive religion is in our world. So you have I, the vast majority, six billion, let's say, folks who believe in some kind of God-like being, some theistic thing out there. It is an overwhelming majority of human beings believe this, and they're, they're going to find this interesting, and they're going to have some questions like, what is going on here? Why would so many people believe in imaginary beings? What is like causing that. And if you look at the statistics just in America, these are the statistics we all know. There's 75% of Americans who claim to be Christian. Fortunately, that number is very slowly inching down. And half of Americans believe that the Bible is literally true. <laughs> like, think about that. Just ponder that. That means if you're walking out on the street, every other person believes that the Bible is literally true. Genesis, Exodus, the ark, all of that is literally true. It's amazing. And I think that the aliens would notice it. And they might ask, because obviously there is no God and God is imaginary, like what is going on? Why would anyone, why would six billion of us believe in imaginary beings? They would, they would legitimately ask that question. And they would also ask questions like this, like how could anyone believe in the superstition of prayer? Or how could anyone read just the first sentence of the Bible? In the beginning, God, an imaginary person, created the heavens and the earth. Well, that's not true. Like we all know that's not true because the universe is 13 billion years old and the earth is 4 billion years old-ish. And we know from the very first sentence it's all wrong. And the more you read through just the first couple of chapters, it's all wrong. Like we can look at it and we can see that. Then there's the utter ambiguity. So some people can say, that God wants us to love all homosexuals, and another person could say God wants us to kill all homosexuals, and that ambiguity, like no one ever arbitrates and says this is right and this isn't, which is crazy. Like that amount of ambiguity tells us something. The whole idea of relationships with God, 
the Genesis creation story, and then there's Noah's Ark. 50% of Americans believe this story is literally true. Just If you go to Amazon.com sometime and just type in Noah's Ark, there's thousands of books and posters and games and puzzles and toys and all celebrating the mass global genocide that is the Noah's Ark story. What, what is going on? So here's a fun fact. In PG-13 movies, you are allowed one non-sexual use of the word fuck per script. Now that gives me a budget because I consider this a PG-13 kind of audience here. We could say it's R, but I'm gonna go with PG-13. So I have this budget, one use. So my first instinct is to do this, but I'm not going to use it there. I have a budget of one use and I'm gonna save it. So Noah's Ark, think about the aliens. They're down, they're looking at us, and they, this is a terrible PowerPoint slide. This is the worst PowerPoint slide you could ever make, right? It violates every rule. It's, you know, too many words. But just think about the process they're going to go through. Like, wait a minute. Wait. You believe that a perfect, all-loving, omniscient God created the universe, earth, and all of life from a blank sheet of paper, but then he didn't like it in his perfection and omniscience. He didn't like what he created, so he chose to murder nearly every living human, animal, and plant with a giant flood for which there is no evidence at all, and you worship this being, right? That's the proposition, and they would do this. So David, <laughs> I, have you ever looked up the history of this? This is from David was on Fox with O'Reilly talking about tides. This is O'Reilly's famous tide diatribe. And that face comes from that video. Someone, you know, picked the contrasted it or whatever the word is, posterized it. And that's where that, that is David posterized from his interview with, with O'Reilly. So anyway, that's what the aliens would do. And then you have to remember this, which we've already stated, 75% of Americans are Christian, and one half of us Americans, every other person believes that Noah's Ark is literally true. The aliens would be astounded. I think they would, well, they would have to research it, and they would have to figure out what is going on. Okay, now, just as a quick aside, then there's ISIS. Okay, so we have all these Christians in America and around the world they believe some crazy stuff. We know it's, it's crazy. But ISIS just takes it to a whole new level. It's like a horrible movie that has been brought to reality. So the beheadings and the crucifixions and the mass slaughter of innocent people and the raping and the pillaging and the, the floggings and the stone. It's just unbelievable how awful and... There, it's hard to describe it. So this is one thing I think that almost all of humanity can agree on. Not all of humanity. There's probably a billion outliers. But everybody else, I think we can agree that ISIS truly is insanity. And we should say, fuck ISIS. This is, <laughs> you want to put a hashtag in front of it? Like, this is unbelievable. The aliens would look at this like, what are you guys doing down there? It's just amazing that we are in the 21st century and we have these Stone Age, unbelievably reprehensible people running around, apparently without a lot of restriction. They could take over a whole country and then another one and then another one. It's just unbelievable as a species that this is happening. And then you look... I don't know if you saw this. This is a thing that came out, a meme kind of photo that came out several weeks ago. And it compares what ISIS thinks Islam is about in terms of punishment and then what they do in Saudi Arabia. And I doubt you can read it, but, well, I doubt you can even see a pointer. Maybe you can. So this column is here's what ISIS thinks and here's what Saudi Arabia thinks. 
Saudi Arabia and ISIS are nearly identical. So if you blaspheme Islam, death. If you are homosexual, death. If you drink alcohol, you're going to get 80 lashes. If you commit adultery and you're married, you're going to get stoned to death. Adultery, if you're not married, you're going to get 100 lashes. Stealing, you get your hand cut off. It's amazing that it's not just ISIS, that there's this whole other part of the world, large part of the world, that believes the same kind of stuff and is actually implementing it on a nationwide level, like killing people because they don't like Islam or because they happen to be homosexual. It's insanity. So let's leave that aside and come back to Noah's Ark for one minute. So how could anyone, any adult in our modern society profess belief in Noah's Ark? That is a legitimate question. Like, what is going on there? And that is what the book How God Works is about. It's trying to unravel what's going on here. And the the basis of it is that in our natural state, human beings are not good thinkers. We suck at it, actually. And if you look at really primitive societies with all their superstitions and magic, and you, know, you look at even where we came from 500 years ago in Europe, humans aren't that great at thinking, by and large. Like in groups, large groups, we tend to be really poor at thinking. And we don't get better unless we're taught how to think. And we've heard several speakers mention critical thinking. That's the thing you have to learn in order to be a good thinker. So what is going on with religion and why, or one reason why so many people believe in it and it's so sticky is because they can't think critically. They've never been taught how. And there's this group of things that collide together to create a really solid convincing illusion that prayer works, for example, or that God exists. And if you've studied uh, logical fallacies or if you've been in the atheist community for any length of time, you've heard of most of these. There's things like confirmation bias, anecdotal evidence, the placebo effect, superstitions, regression fallacy, post hoc fallacy. These things, they're actually quite powerful. If you've not been taught to discount them then you fall prey to these faulty ways of thinking, and it seems like prayer works. You can be convinced by a good preacher or huckster that you are having your prayers answered. Of course, you can unmask it all by saying, well, wait, let me not pray to get my cancer healed. Let me pray to get all cancers on the planet healed. Or, you know, let me not pray to get my one leg fixed Let me pray for all amputees to get fixed. In other words, if you pray big, you immediately know that prayer is a farce. It's just, but if you've not been confronted with that, you've never thought about that, you've never thought about critical thinking, you miss it. And then that illusion combines with this giant ball of emotion that is religion. All the things that have been wrapped into religion, like what happens after we die? Well, we know that after we die, we're dead. That's the end of it. There's nothing that happens after we die. That's a fact. It's an unfortunate or sad fact, but that's how life is. That's how it is for everybody. Where did the universe come from? Well, we don't know yet. Like a decade or a century ago, we didn't know that there were galaxies and we didn't know there was DNA and we still don't know how to cure the common cold. We don't know where the universe came from yet, but we will figure it out. All these things are wrapped into religion, including community and tribalism. And so you have this super powerful illusion and then this super powerful ball of emotion that keeps dragging you back. And then you combine that with ideological purity and a couple other things and you have this super sticky mental phenomenon that is called religion. And it, you know, it's, it's a huge problem. And the only way to fix it is to teach people out of it. So let's just talk about one of these really quick. Double think. I just find it amazing. And here's the best example I've got. There are people on this planet 
by the billions who will say in one minute, God must be hidden. Because if he weren't hidden, then faith wouldn't be a thing. You know, you wouldn't have faith. He would expose it and everyone would believe in God. And on the next minute, they will say, oh, but God wrote the Bible and incarnated himself. And he answers prayers. He has relationships. He does all these wonderful miracles. That's crazy that you hold those two ideas simultaneously in your head. It's just another example of how people who haven't been taught to think critically and have never been called on stuff like this can get themselves into this weird illusional trap. So that sounds insane, the idea that someone can hold two polar opposite ideas. But if you think about it, humans do that all the time in politics and in religion and in advertisements and all, it's really super common. So it's not insanity. It is simply lack of education. And this, I think, is where we can fix things. So if we were to think about this goal, how are we going to end Christianity and Islam and ISIS and all this craziness? The way is through education, teaching people that religion is an illusion that you can solve by learning about critical thinking. So imagine this. We have a class in high school. Prayer is a superstition, an introduction to critical thinking. Or God is imaginary, an introduction to critical thinking. And it's a required class in high school or even middle school. And we just educate the population starting young that this is all nonsense. We have to openly state what you believe is nonsense. It's insanity. We can all agree that ISIS is totally nuts. So let, we could center around that and use it to propel us. There's lots of ways, but this would, would definitely help. Start teaching people. Start saying overtly your belief in prayer is superstition and nonsense. And if you're going to put it forward, you have to know that that's what you're going to get called. You're going to get called on it. Noah's Ark, that's just pure mythology. Let's just state it. Let's teach it. Let's let people understand that this is all crazy. So, in conclusion, here's why I am hopeful. So I've been working at this for 10-ish years, let's say. I, you know, I've written multiple websites. I've done a whole bunch of YouTube videos that have been watched by 16 million people. I've written a book. I would love your ideas on what to do next. If anybody has a great idea, hey, Marshall, you ought to go do this. I would gladly do that as part of this educational effort. But here's why I'm hopeful. If we can just get to this point, that graph, where atheists barely outnumber theists, then we're done because it'll just be a domino effect. And let me show you an example of how this has worked recently. This is a graph that shows views on legalizing marijuana starting on the left in 1969 when hardly anybody thought we should legalize marijuana and going all the way up through 2013. And if you look, the graphs get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, and then they cross, and marijuana is legalized in Colorado. It was that, it was practically instantaneous. So all we have to do is get that same graph going with atheists and theists, get it going closer and closer, and as soon as we outnumber theists, we are done. There will be a giant ripple effect because this graph will get us there, we'll be done with ISIS, we'll be done with all the craziness once and for all, finally. And hopefully, if the aliens come, they will not see this particular malfunction of the human brain because we will have fixed it. So, thank you so much for having me. I'm not.
going to answer for you. <laughs> okay. Um, I see a question over here. Where is our, our microphone? Yeah. I'll just use this one. All right. Okay. We've been doing fabulously with questions. There are actually questions today, and I want to thank you. We're going to keep that up, please. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Hi, uh, Tim Ridge from New Jersey Humanist Network. So um, I, I, I kind of wonder about your certainty that will be done, uh, and I'm going to give an example, a very quick one. So we thought we were done with um, with uh, slavery and 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 you know, you know down you know putting putting black people in their place after the Civil War, and what happened in the next few decades is that. The people who lost the Civil War fought a terrorist action to drive the Union Army out of the South and reinstate Jim Crow. Uh, don't you think that people, even, even theists in the minority, radical theists, would do a similar kind of a thing and to, to try to hang on? So one, one thing on that is if you have not visited the National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis, you should absolutely go there. It will give you a totally different perspective on how an entire race of people in this country who make up like 20% of the population were just pounded into the ground for hundreds of years. It will, it will stun you and it will potentially make you think, I mean, if you aren't a critical thinker, you think, well, White people are assholes. You will, just, you will absolutely come out with that. But it's not true that all white people are assholes. It's just that there's a segment, a big enough segment of assholes, that called the shots for a long time. I think the advantage atheism has is that, is to go back to what David talked about this morning in his, in his opening talk, which was utterly fantastic. I really enjoyed listening to David's talk because it was optimistic and it showed progress. The thing he said is, we're right. And I know that in the case of what happened over the course of 500 years with civil rights, they were right too, but they didn't have the same like they were starting from such a lower position than we're starting and they didn't have the internet and they didn't have so many things that we have now. I just think that if you, like just look at the example of Europe. There is the possibility of us to drive this home over, might take a decade, two decades, three decades, I have no way to know. But I do know that it will eventually come to pass because because of ISIS. I mean, just, and we can all agree, this is nonsense. Let's use that as a starting point. Okay, Saudi Arabia, nonsense, insanity. Then just move it forward and eventually, like it's like dominoes, we just have to state vociferously, this stuff is nonsense and insanity and it's time for humans to move beyond it. Okay. Uh, there are, okay, well, let's see. Where's, the, where's the mic? We're gonna, okay. okay. So as most people are probably aware, one of Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, biggest worries uh, and biggest complaints is, is uh, theists come and knocking on the uh, science classroom to teach religion as, is, as is, if it is actually science. Um, my question is, have we taken any, any measures um, do we have any ideas or proposals uh, as to how to get our own feet uh, in the door of public schools and things like that um, to teach our, our uh, anti-religion ideas? I don't know that I'm the best person to answer that question, but I will, I will comment in two ways. First of all, that whole idea of overtly stating that, say, prayer is a superstition or that God is imaginary and creating courses around it could be one way, like James said, to be strategically controversial and also to push the truth into classrooms overtly. Like, and then the second thing I might comment on is the whole thing that happened in Indiana over the last couple of weeks, 
that to me is so heartening that they passed the law and the day they passed it, the reaction started on so many different fronts against a bill that was specifically about religion in the title, like this firestorm forced them back. That is like a seminal moment in atheism. There is something going on here that I think if we just capture that momentum and keep building on that momentum, it, that was an amazing, surprising thing that happened in Indiana and they deserved it. That is insanity to discriminate against people like that, it's crazy. Okay, we're gonna have two final questions. I know there are more than that number of hands in the air, but before I take those last two, I wanna remind everyone that uh, Marshall, you're going to be signing in uh, the uh, Salon F, yes? Right F after- F for fun. F That's for right. fun, <laughs> uh, right after this. So uh, you might be able to get your question answered then if we're not able to do it here. Yeah, forget and, the um, books, just That's talk. a 15 minute break after this. So um, this is the next question. I, I see a lot of hands and you're very good looking and persuasive everywhere. So I'm gonna close my eyes and let this lady ask her question. Okay, I'm Tammy Williams from Little Rock, Arkansas and I'm a Camp Quest volunteer. <laughs> And, Thank you. And I think that, uh, that that's a really good place if you want your children to be exposed to um, developing critical thinking skills and uh, question, so forth. Please? But my question is, you. are you a supporter and have you volunteered your time? Because your presentation, I think, would really engage children. I have never participated. I do other things. I don't know that there's a Camp Quest near me. But someone who's involved, send me an email. And I, like, I'm like i getting uh, my consciousness raised about it at this meeting. David talked about it. It's been talked to me several times while I've been here. So somebody email me. Very well. OK. I'm going to go here down front. I, and uh, this is the last question. We will have a 15-minute break where you can go and have Marshall sign his book. Uh, by the way, it is not only the aliens that are outstanding, uh, the, the Europeans are too. Uh, we are <laughs> amazed at the religiosity in America. And my question is, I mean, uh, what is the reason for the difference between those, you know, between the non-religiosity of Europe versus the insane religiosity in America? <laughs> <laughs> oh. That, that was a very good question. What, why, why are we here in the U.S. so bleeping religious and in Europe it's not so? Um, population shifts. They're, Europe is getting older and then church ladies are not reproducing. There um, are so many yeah. explanations that have been offered like Europe is smarter than America or um, you know, we don't know why 60% of Americans all of a sudden, like myself, became obese, to give you another example. Like, there are certain things we don't know. Why social dynamics occur and what is causing this rush toward insanity, if you want to call it that, in America. But, like David said this morning, I think the tide is turning, and although we're behind Europe, I think we will catch up, and I hope that that is true. Yes. Thank you so much, Marshall. So, Salon F, like fun, like 15, the number of minutes before our next speaker. So uh, get on over there, get in line, get your books, and...